Welcome to the second morning of PyCon 2016. As we are in the city of uh, handcrafted artisan beer and handcrafted artisan clothing, uh, handcrafted artisan wax canvas luggage and so forth, um, if you have not been in the Python community for very long, or if you're new, uh, you might not uh, know that the inventor of the Python language, Guido Van Rossum, not only put it up on the internet for the rest of our use 25 years ago, uh, this spring in 1991, but that he also has continued to uh, handcraft and work with it as our BDFL, our benevolent dictator for life. He has continued to guide its evolution as people have had a lot of dumb ideas about what should happen next with Python <laughs> that would have made it a lot more complicated, but as occasionally very, very good ideas have come along as well. It is Guido who has the final word, who is, if you will, the hand crafter of Python, the, the artisan who chooses which features gradually over the years have built Python into a world-class language. And as is, is his usual habit, he's here to speak to us this year at PyCon. Welcome, Guido Van Rossum. Hello. <clears throat> Sounds like everyone can hear me. So, a keynote. Wonderful to be back in Portland, by the way. I have had many OSCONs here. Uh, I have a variety of topics I want to talk about, but I also want to have time at the end for Q&A, so I hope the AV people are prepared for that. <coughs> to start with, uh, I thought it would be nice to get back to my roots and actually present a mini State of the Union. How are things doing in Python? Uh, what's happening? Uh, what does the future bring? And if I don't answer all your questions, uh, that's what the Q&A is for. <coughs> there is something else in between, but let's start with uh, the future of Python 2. Well. I keep having to uh, dig up that little picture out, by, out of my archives. Until 2020, we will really not see anything besides security fixes, maybe some new platforms that absolutely need to be used because the old platforms that they replace uh, are no longer around. And very rarely, usually only when I make a mistake and edit in the wrong branch, uh, a bug fix. <coughs> if you want to know exactly when the party is going to be, it's going to be at PyCon 2020. We'll have the official end of Python 2.7 live party. That's going to be a big one. And if you want to know exactly how long that will take, go to pythonclock.org. So thank you. Uh, I also have a had a design idea for uh, what the clock should really look like. It should be more like a sort of them, one of those James Bond bombs. <coughs> but Brad has a much more gentler uh, CSS sensibility. Anyway, what's new in Python 3.5? Well, actually, this is also old news, because Python 3.5 came out right after last year's PyCon, I believe. Uh, one very interesting, notable thing is native coroutine syntax. You can define a coroutine by saying async dev, blah, blah, blah. Under the hood, it's actually a generator, but you can no longer see that it's a generator. It really feels like a coroutine. It can interact with async IO, the library, or with other coroutine frameworks that you build, or you can just build a little app out of bare coroutines. Uh, the important keywords are async and await. Await basically suspends your coroutine. There's also async for, and uh, I think there's even async with. We'll go look it up in PEP 492. So there's, there's some more stuff in Python 3.5 that I want to call out, because I know that not everybody has sort of migrated to Python 3.5 yet. Uh, so there's the matrix, multi matrix multiply that uh, NumPy people really like. 
There is uh, more unpacking syntax. This is just one of the new things that are uh, possible in Python 3.5, which is pretty obvious. Uh, bytes formatting is back. If you have sort of old Python 2 code that uses a lot of string formatting to generate essentially byte strings, uh, Python 3.5 has a sort of lets you still write that code and doesn't actually look so bad either. And then, of course, there's the gradual typing. Uh, with three colleagues from Dropbox, I already gave a talk about that last Sunday. Uh, the hello world of uh, gradual typing in Python actually is celebrating its 16th birthday this year, because I started thinking about that and presented that exact same example in the year 2000. So. This is a mini State of the Union. We're going pretty fast. What's new in Python 3.6? Python 3.6 is not out yet. It's, uh, the first alpha was just released maybe two weeks ago. The code freeze, the first beta, is going to happen in September. And the final release is going to happen just before Christmas for everyone to have some something to play with on that boring uh, day after Christmas. So what's going to be new in Python 3.6? Uh, here are a couple of things that I dug out of the pep archives. We'll have F strings. As if we didn't have enough different ways of formatting strings, here is an even more convenient way that sort of combines the flexibility and attention to detail of format strings with the convenience of just using print statements. And no, you don't have to use it in a print statement. You can use it for any kind of formatting. And yes, it only references local variables. And it's actually compiled to code that pulls out the local variables. Anyway, again, track down the pep and read it if you're more interested. And maybe there's even documentation already. Or if there's not, please help write, it, write that documentation. That's why this is a handcrafted artisanal community. People, people help out. We also got underscores in numbers, uh, because everyone else got them. <coughs> uh, the Pathlips library's future, its life hung on a thread. There was a large group of people who wanted it to be very different. Uh, there was some serious opposition. There was also an endless discussion on b what to do with it and how to save it and what was the right way to deal with file system paths. Because, well, are they strings? Are they byte sequences? You can't even get two core developers to agree on that, let alone two users. Anyway, we now have a protocol that any object that claims to represent the file system path can turn itself into either strings or bytes, whichever it seems uh, deems most appropriate, uh, which you can then pass to uh, a variety of system calls that continue to take strings. We'll also modify a large number of popular utility functions in the standard library to use this protocol to accept pathlib objects or other similar objects. Uh, so hopefully pathlib is uh, up to a wonderful uh, productive future, and everybody's going to use it. And if you have your own favorite pathlib-like library, you can also support this, support this uh, protocol and be on an equal footing. OK, we have a secrets module. Apparently, people are uh, looking for ways to generate uh, random passwords or tokens uh, were continuously sort of re-implementing poorly cryptographically understood algorithms. We ha now have the secrets module that has a bunch of different functions that are approved by cryptographers uh, that give you the right kind of random bits. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about local time disambiguation. <laughs> Although I really want to because it's such a fascinating topic, but I'm not going to do it. Catch me afterwards or, well, there's the always Q&A. Oh, yeah, and we're moving to GitHub. Five years ago, we were faced with the choice. We have to get off subversion. What do we use, Mercurial or GitHub? And Mercurial looked so much more comfortable for us dyed-in-the-wool subversion 
users because the branching model was the same, the command line structure was the same, the concept concepts you had to learn to get going were the same. The only cool difference was that it had all your revisions locally. Git, on the other hand, had all that plus a completely indecipherable structure for commands. Nobody understood how to do branches. OK, I can go on. So we chose Mercurial. Now, somehow, everybody understands Git's branching model. Everybody uses Git. Everybody sort of gets born with a GitHub account. So <laughs> we're going with the program. And, and thanks so much to Brett Cannon again for taking the initiative to sort of Get us going, and be before the end of the year, we promise we will be on GitHub. <coughs> so what do we have beyond Python 3.6? Well, this is at this point all completely idle spe speculation, or sometimes I just feed Python ideas, some crazy ideas, in the hope that they'll sort of, I don't know. It's fun to watch. It's, 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 it's like throwing a ball of wool into a nest full of kittens. <coughs> so I don't know what will come of the match statement ideas or dict unpacking. Uh, variable declaration syntax is something I would really like for myself, or actually I would like it for uh, the gradual typing, because that's the one big thing uh, where we currently don't have syntax to declare a variable uh, redundantly in this example to be of type integer, you have to use a type command. Uh, I really would like that to be part of the language. Uh, unfortunately, all the alternatives that I've come up with so far that aren't much more verbose than the type command uh, have trouble parsing or trouble introducing. Var, for example, seems to be a very common variable name, so we really can't use a var statement for this. Anyway, meet us on Python ideas for that. Uh, then at the Language Summit, uh, hopefully by now Linux Weekly News has published uh, a summary of what went on at the Language Summit, so please go there, lwn.net. Larry Hastings is performing a gil gilectomy on a live Python interpreter, and the results are apparently that the Python interpreter can still run extensions, and everything is only about three times as slow. Which, which is actually very good science, because he's reproducing an experiment that Greg Stein performed in the late 90s. So we know it's still slower when you remove the gill. But Larry says there's lots of low-hanging watermelons, and maybe he can eventually get it faster. So if you're interested in this kind of esoteric stuff, come to the sprints, because Larry is going to be there and uh, look for help. So then I have a few other things. Uh, first, I need to apologize for a very obvious typo I made in my slides last year. Uh, at the very last moment, I decided I wanted to say something about female core developers, because there are so few of them, if any. And in my haste to sort of get that in while I was rushing to get to the, to the venue and, and I left in a typo, and six months later, I still got email about that one typo in my slide. And I'm so sorry. Uh, and I'm even more sorry that we still don't have two female core developers. I was approached by several women right at that PyCon where I first made the promise, again at various times afterwards. Some women said I would be interested in that uh, somehow None of them have yet made it to actually be Python core contributors. Uh, well, we've, we've received a few patches, but I'm, I'm not doing it right. I'm, and so uh, there are now more people in the core developer group who are also offering to mentor specifically women who aspire to join our club, because we really don't like that it's, it's sort of what it currently is, even though it's a I mean, it's a fun club to be in, and I want other people to also feel the fun. 
So Raymond Hettinger and Brad Cannon, Brad again, uh, are also offering to mentor. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And now, oh, I wish I had this, this Monty Python BBC announcing voice, and now for something completely different. <laughs> and actually, I, oh dear, this is not how I wanted to see it at all. <laughs> what was it? Now maybe this works. So, this is a lot of text and I'm going to read it, so I'm not sure if I can make much eye contact with you all. So last month, the Netherlands celebrated King's Day. I have to say I'm still confused by the King's Day thing because all my life it's been the Dutch Queen and Queen's Day was always on April, April 30th. And now it's King's Day and it's on April 27th. Uh, and I, I sort of, I feel a little uncomfortable about that. I'm, I'm in my heart, I'm, I'm not much into royalty, but there we have it. The Dutch embassy in San Francisco, which is close to where I live, invited me to give a little talk to an audience of Dutch and American entrepreneurs and tech people. I don't know, they, they just sort of, I don't know where their mailing list comes from, but somehow I'm on their mailing list as a potential speaker. So this time I caved in and I wrote this thing. So part of what follows is the TLDR of my autobiography. Part of it is about the significance of programming languages. And Pyth part of it is about Python's big idea. And so because I am pretending that I'm still at this event at the embassy, I'm going to say, Leve de Koning, long live the king. <laughs> There is a fellow Dutchman, clearly. <laughs> he knows how that goes. So Python is a programming language created by a community. I was introduced as Python's creator, but I'm really just more sort of a mentor for the community. <coughs> just a very opinionated mentor. So yeah, there's a lot of rambling here, and I will get to a point eventually. So. To introduce myself, and I think that introduction here is still somewhat relevant. I'm a nerd, a geek, that's not new. I'm probably somewhere on the autistic spectrum. I'm also a very late bloomer. I graduated from college in, when I was 26 years old, which by current modern American standards was kind of late. In, at that time, it was not, not that unusual even. I was 45 before I got married. I'm now 60, and I have a 14-year-old son. That's sometimes exhausting, but st still a lot of fun. <coughs> Maybe I just have a hard time with decisions. I've lived in the US, for example, for 20 years, and I'm still not a citizen. I'm just a permanent resident, even though when you ask me, I have no desire to go back to the Netherlands. I, 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 I feel I'm American. I'm no Steve Jobs, I'm no Mark Zuckerberg, but when I was 35 years old, I created a programming language, and it got a bit of a following. And what happened next really was pretty amazing. And I'll get to more of that. But now I want to go really far back in time. At age 10, sort of how, what the, the roots of my nerdiness, or when I first discovered. At age 10, my parents gave me an educational electronics kit. That kit was made by Philips, and it was actually an amazing kit. And every once in a while, I googled the name of that kit, and there, is, there are still a couple of Dutch electronics amateur enthusiasts who have copies of that kit and photos of it online, and I'm just drooling. I can, I know what the components taste like. <laughs> it's like, it's such a visceral memory. It's amazing, but it really was amazing. First, I, I just followed the directions, and I'm, I'm very good at following directions, so I, that everything always worked. And later, I even figured out how to design my own circuits, and I. I literally got into computing after building my own NAND gates out of discrete components. So my first kit had three transistors, and they were like 
way more than I could, could afford to replace from my little allowance. So I took one of my first models, a blinking light. That's two transistors, two uh, capacitors, a few resistors, and a battery. And I took it to show and tell in, I believe, fifth grade. And it was a total dud. Nobody cared. Nobody understood why I brought that thing. Nobody was interested. Nobody was excitedly pointing at Nobody was asking, how does it work? There was no one else who knew anything about electronics. And that was one of my first, my earliest memories of finding that I was a geek. Until then, I had just been a quick learner, and that also doesn't score you any points on the social uh, <coughs> pecking order in elementary school. So in high school, I developed my nerdiness further I don't know why Word is showing all these wiggly things. I hung out with a few other kids that were interested in electronics. Big improvement. I actually had my own little social circle. And during physics class, we just sat in the back of the class discussing NAND gates while the rest of the class was still figuring out Ohm's law. Fortunately, our teacher, our physics teacher, had figured us out. And he, at some point, employed us to build a digital timer which I think was actually by my design, and we built it together. Uh, and he used it in class to demonstrate the law of gravity. It, it, it sort of, it could measure, uh, I think, one hundredth of a second, and, and sort of multiples of that. So you dropped something, and it, it would tell you exactly, well, that took 400 milliseconds. And then they would plot it and show that it was uh, some kind of parabola. So this was a great project. I didn't care about gra laws of gravity, already knew them. But it showed that our skills, that this, this electronics hobby stuff that we did, was useful. And the other kids still thought we were weird. It was the 70s, so many of them were actually into smoking pot and uh, rebelling against uh, society. And then there was another group who were already preparing for successful careers as doctors or lawyers or tech managers. But everyone left me alone, and I left them alone, and I still graduated as one of the best of my class. So I went to the University of Amsterdam. It was close to home, and for a teenager in the Netherlands in the 70s, that was a pretty cool place. I would, in, in my mind, it was the only cool place because I had sort of watched various European student protests in 1968 on television. And then my high school physics teacher was a little surprised and disappointed that I chose to major in math, not in physics. But if I look back, that, that difference didn't matter. What mattered was, in the basement of the science building, was a mainframe computer. And the way I believe it, I, I remember it, I didn't even know the word computer, less, much less the concept of a computer, when I entered college at, the, at age 18. But this mainframe computer was love at first sight for me. There were card punches, line printers, batch jobs. So more to the point, I quickly learned to program in languages named like Algol or Fortran or later Pascal, that was the best one. And mostly those names actually have been forgotten, but at the time they were highly influential. And soon again, the, I, there I was sitting in the back of algebra class or Galois theory, which I never figured out what it was about. Ignoring the lecturer, no wonder I didn't figure it out, correcting my computer programs. Because that was where, where my emotional energy was invested. Why was that? So in that basement around the mainframe, something pretty amazing was actually happening. I don't think I was quite aware of it at the time. But there was this loosely knit group of students and staff with similar interests. And we, we were all deeply into programming. And we exchanged tricks of the trade. We shared subroutines and programs. We united in alliances against the staff of the mainframe 
uh, especially in endless cat and mouse games over disk space. And in those days, of course, disk space was unbelievably precious in, in a way that you will never understand today. The Fortunately, the files were also much smaller. But the most important lesson I learned there was about sharing. Most of the programming tricks I learned there died with the mainframe era. But the idea that software needs to be shared, of course, is stronger than ever. And today we call it open source, and it's a whole movement. And you all know that. The, the, the business people in the Dutch embassy hopefully had at least heard of it, but were interested in hearing more about it. So at the time, my immediate knowledge of the tricks and the trades of mainframe computer actually did matter a lot, because the mainframe staff had an operating systems group, and through some kind of enlightened management, or who knows what, they employed some part-time students, or maybe it was just that students were much cheaper than the full-time staff, and they worked harder. So they posted a vacancy, and I applied, and I instantly got offered a job on the spot. I don't know, maybe I had a reputation already. So this changed my life completely. Suddenly, I had unlimited access to this mainframe, because the staff, of course, could always access it and do whatever they wanted on it. And there was no more fighting for disk space, also no more fighting for terminals. There were always dedicated terminals for the staff. Plus, I had access to the source code of the operating system, which was an enormously big deal, because that was a very highly guarded secret, plus the only way you could access it was uh, on a printout, and there was only one copy. Anyway, there were also, again, dozens of colleagues who showed me how all, uh, all of that worked and who sort of helped stoke my enthusiasm and taught me more tricks and other in interesting th stuff. So now I had my dream job. I was programming all day with we had real customers, the other programmers who were using the mainframe, the operating systems group sort of supported those people. So my studies kind of stalled, and I, I almost dropped out of college, and I would not have graduated except for an enlightened manager at the mainframe uh, management group and a pro one professor who hadn't given up on me. So they actually nudged me towards finishing some classes, and they probably pulled some strings. And eventually, after seven years or so in there, I did graduate. Yay! So I immediately landed another dream job. And that was the kind of job that would not have been open without graduating. So the graduation was very useful. <coughs> So I had never lost my interest in programming languages as, as something to study. And now I was joining a team that was building a new programming language. Not something you see every day, even today. I mean, yeah, there are people working on Rust. And obviously, there are people working on Python. But even Rust started maybe 10 years ago. Who is working on designing a new programming language today? That's that's a pretty uh, heady experience. So the designers of this language hoped that their language would take over the world and replace BASIC. So now it was the 80s, and BASIC was the language of choice for a new generation of amateur programmers. They were coding on microcomputers like the Apple II and the Commodore 64, which to me personally was uninteresting because I had had this mainframe my whole life. <coughs> But this, this was a cool project. And, and the team considered BASIC sort of a pest that the world should be rid of. And we were building a language named ABC. And ABC would stamp out BASIC. Stamp out BASIC was the team's motto. Now, sadly, for a variety of reasons, the marketing or maybe the timing sucked. And after four years, ABC was abandoned not having had effectively more than a dozen users outside the team that made it. 
So since then, I've spent many hours trying to understand why ABC failed, even though its heart was so clearly in the right place. So, well, apart from being somewhat over-engineered, my best answer is that ABC died because there was no internet in those days. This was still the mid-80s, and at least in Amsterdam, we did not have an internet. And as a result, there could not be a healthy feedback loop between the makers of the language and its users. So ABC's design was all a one-way street. In fact, it was worse. When I joined the team in 82, the language design was complete. Four years later, the language design was identical to that original design. Four years of work on the language had not revealed a single flaw in the design. Or you can interpret that the way, however you want. Anyway, just half a decade later, I was picking through ABC's ashes looking for ideas for my own language. And I realized that that missing feedback loop was one of the things that was wrong with ABC, and I decided to improve on that. So my motto was going to be release early, release often, which I heard the sort of encouragement was uh, by Democrats in Chicago. Vote early, vote often. And in 1990, my institution in Amsterdam, that wasn't so backward after all, was, had, had been the first uh, internet node, and we we now had some internet access and access to users, and there, there, there it was. It was possible to have a user community. And so I'm looking back now 25 years later, and the internet and the open source movement, also known as free software, of course, those two things really changed everything. And of course, something called Moore's Law, which makes computers faster, so that whatever great idea you have today that you can't quite implement, you can implement next year. <coughs> but these things together have entirely changed the interaction between the makers of computer software and its users. We, we sort of we can ask the users questions and we'll get answers. And the users can ask the language makers questions and submit patches and feature requests and all sorts of things. And it's my belief that these developments and how I made, managed to make good use of that uh, have contributed more to the success of my programming language than my programming skills or experience, no matter how awesome those were, of course. Now, it also didn't, help, it didn't hurt that I named the language Python. That, that was a bit of unwitting marketing genius on my part. I, I meant to just honor the irreverent comedic genius of Monty Python's Flying Circus. And back in 1990, I didn't think I had much to lose. I mean, we were, we were naming components of this, the larger operating system we were building all the time, and we gave them all sorts of crazy names. Uh, TV shows were actually a uh, popular uh, option. But nowadays, I'm sure brand research firms would be happy to uh, take a lot of your money to tell you what the associations are in the brains of the users uh, when they, they hear a name like that, but I was just being flippant. So, again, remember this is, I'm, I'm, I'm recycling material. I have promised the ambassador not to bore you with technical discussions on the merit of the different programming languages, and I will not bore you guys with that either because you already have made your choices. But I would like to say a few things about what programming languages mean to the people who use them, programmers, us. Typically, when you ask a programmer to explain to a layperson what, what is a programming language, you get an answer like, oh, the programming language is just how you tell the computer what to do. And then they go on maybe to tell what computers can do. 
But if that was all, if a programming language was just a way to tell a computer what to do, why would programmers be so passionate about programming languages when you hear them talk amongst themselves? So in, in reality, programming languages are much more than just how you tell a computer what to do. They're how programmers express ideas and how they communicate those ideas. And the audience for those ideas is other programmers. We program for each other, not for the computer. And the reason of that, for that is that the computer can take care of itself. If you design the language with a completely stupid syntax, and this is not something I was telling the ambassador at the time, the computer, you can write a parser for a stupid syntax just fine, and you can execute it just as efficiently. The computer really doesn't care about any of that. It's other programmers that you want to express your ideas to and be able to communicate, exchange ideas, feedback. So programmers are always working with other programmers. And poorly communicated ideas can cause very expensive flops. And I'm sure you've, you've heard some of the stories about miscommunication due to uh, programming uh, bugs. In, in fact, I think the, that ideas expressed in a programming language also often actually reach the end users of the program, the people who will never read or even know about the program, but they're nevertheless affected by those ideas embodied in those programs. That's why those ideas are so important. So think of the incredible success of companies like uh, Google and or Facebook or your next startup. At the core of these are ideas, ideas about what computers can do for people. And to be effective, an idea must be expressed as a computer program. You can't just sort of throw out an idea and the idea will take care of itself. That's not how it works. You have to have the computer program. Then that will take care of itself. And you have to use a programming language. And the language that's best to express an idea will give the team that uses that language a key advantage because it gives the team, member, team members who are people clarity about their idea or the, uh, those ideas that they're exchanging. So the ideas underlying Google or Facebook couldn't be more different. And in fact, the favorite programming languages at those companies sort of are at the opposite ends of the spectrum of programming lang language design. And that is my point about programming languages. So here's a true story. The first version of Google was written in Python. And the reason was that Python was the right language to express the original, original ideas that Larry Page and Sergey Brin had about how to index the web and organize the search results. I think the sort of all the information of the world came a little later. But they could run these ideas on their computers, too. So anyway, in 1990, over 25 years ago, before Google and Facebook, I made my own programming language. I named it Python. Duh. But what is the idea of Python? Why is Python so successful? Is it the indentation? <laughs> is it the hash tables? How does Python distinguish itself from other programming languages? And why are you all staring at me like that? Well, I have a lot of answers to that, actually. And some of the answers are actually quite technical. And I do not want to talk about those in a keyword. Uh, some of the reasons behind Python's success, I'm sure, were purely coincidental, like being at the right place and the right time. But I believe the most important idea is that Python is developed on the internet entirely in the open by a community of volunteers, but not amateurs, who feel people who feel passion as well as ownership of their language. And that is also what a group of geeks in the basement of the science building around the mainframe computer was all about.
So here's a surprise. Like any good inspirational speech, this, the point of this talk is really about happiness. So what do I have to say about happiness? I'm happiest when I feel that I'm part of this community. I'm lucky that I can feel it in my day job too, where I'm a principal engineer at Dropbox. If I can't feel this community, I don't feel alive. And so I believe it's for other community members. And this feeling is contagious. And there are members of our community all over the world, and I, I don't actually have to tell you all this. The Python user community is formed of millions of people who consciously use Python, love using it. There are active member organizations, or m active members actually, organizing Python conferences, the PyCons, in far away places like Lam Namibia, Iran, Iraq, even Ohio. So my favorite story, a year ago I spent 20 minutes on a video conference call with a classroom full of faculty and staff at Babylon University in southern Iraq. And I was answering questions about Python. And thanks to the efforts of the audacious woman who organized this event in a war-ridden country, the students at Babylon University are now being taught introductory programming classes using Python. If it hadn't been for her... <laughs> they would be using Java. <laughs> so, honestly, I, I still tear up when I think about the power of that experience. And in, in my wildest dreams, I would never, I had never expected I would touch lives so far away and so different from my own. So on that note, I'd like to leave you. A programming language created by a community fosters happiness in users around the world. And next year, I may go to PyCon Cuba. And that will make me happy. <laughs> Q&A time. <laughs>